the digital rent to rent guide is finally here. So I guess you're wondering, why am I giving away this information for free? Let me be straightforward, blunt and honest with you. I was one of those people who paid thousands of pounds for a property strategy course only to realise the information was already out there. However, the trick in the industry was to miss out the key joining words that made everything made sense. So if you go through YouTube, you'll see numerous videos talking about the rent to rent strategy, but you just can't quite get it. Although there's so much information, you just don't understand how it works, which means you're only left with signing up to one of those expensive courses. I've decided to save you the trouble because I had met people along the way or on this course who were in a different financial situation to me and had struggled to gather the thousands of pounds together to be on this course. They had made some major sacrifices. And what I realised along the journey on this course was not only did you have to have money to pay for the course, but you also have to have money to have your deposit for your first property. And some people, they only have enough for one, not both. So if you're in that position where you have money and you're having to choose between paying for an expensive course but then you know at the end you'll have no money left for a deposit versus having the money for both, then this is the answer. The money you currently have, save it and buy this guide or make a donation depending on what platform you're listening to this on. But before you take this step, I want you to understand that there is some stigma in this business and that's due to the strategy being used in the past and people not adhering to the legal requirements or treating it like an actual business. It's a business. It's not a get rich quick scheme. So if that's what you think, then stop listening now because you are not going to get rich quick. Do not come into this industry completely blinded by not having a clue of what you're doing, messing things up and then giving the industry a bad name and a bad reputation. However, if this is done the right way, it can be an excellent win for both you, the landlord and even the tenants. It's important not to cut corners because although you may speed up the process, Believe me, it will always come back to you in the end and will ruin all your hard work. Rent to rent is a great strategy for making serious cash flow from a property without having to actually own it. It's very simple. You essentially rent a property from the landlord and relet the rooms individually, which achieves a much higher rent than what you're paying. Then you simply take the difference between the total rent from the rooms and what you're paying the landlord. The money that is left over, minus the expenses, is your profit to keep. It's essential that the landlord or the agent and or know that you are using this strategy. If you rent this property through your name and you apply this strategy, you are illegally subletting. However, if you have a registered business and explain to the landlord and the agent that you are doing a company let and you'll be reletting the rooms to individuals, then you are operating within the law. So there are two strategies that you can use in rent to rent. Number one is rent the property via a company let. 
This is where you work with agents and landlords. You rent the property just as anyone normally would, but through your company name, making it known that your intention is to then relet the rooms to your tenants. You will normally need to pay a standard one month's rent and one month's deposit up front. This will enable you to take the property on. Some agents or landlords may require a bigger deposit because it's a company let. Strategy number two is to manage the property free of charge on the landlord's behalf. This is where you work with private landlords only. You offer to manage the property for them free of charge on the basis that they're happy for the house to be let by the rooms. You guarantee them a fixed monthly rent, offer to pay all utility bills and keep the property in good condition. Then like the first strategy, you keep the difference between the total rent from the rooms and the amount you're paying the landlord. You normally will not pay anything up front to a private landlord. Instead, you will pay them one month in arrears, starting one month from the date you sign your management agreement, giving you a month to fill the rooms and make the money first. Choosing your property and area. For a rent to rent deal to work, you need at least three rooms that you can let out as bedrooms, preferably five. For example, a three bedroom house with two separate reception rooms that can be used as bedrooms. Remember, depending on the figures, you can mix and match this. For example, you may want to only use four rooms as bedrooms and keep one reception room as a shared living room. Co-living space. Or, for example, a two-bedroom property with a separate living room that can be used as a third bedroom. This only works in areas with high room rates. Be sure to look at your floor plans where possible or ask the agent or landlord about the layout before you travel to view a property. This is so important as it saves time and money. For example, you may find a three bedroom house with a reception room, but when you see it in person, the reception room is an open plan to the kitchen or a bathroom. Of course, this will not be appropriate as you cannot rent a room out to a tenant where the other tenants have to pass through to get to the kitchen. Now there is the option to use a partition wall, but as this is a manual for beginners, I'll just keep it simple. It's completely up to you which area and how many you want to work with. As a general rule, it's wise to choose an area no more than an hour away from where you live or spend the most time. This is because you're going to need to visit your properties frequently, at least in the beginning when you're filling the rooms. Location of the property within an area is something to consider also. Properties close to public transport, town centres and shops will be the easiest to let by the room. No one wants a room in a house that is miles away from everything. After choosing your area, you now need to do the numbers. Research the market, rental prices for rooms in your area. Have a look on spare rooms, write them down, calculate them. For example, double rooms in an area going for £500 a month and a single room for £400 a month. Let's do the figures. Based on the model that we discussed, a three bedroom house with two reception rooms, giving us four double rooms, the two double bedrooms upstairs, 
one dining room downstairs and one living room and a single bedroom upstairs. That will be four doubles at £500 and a single room at £400, giving us the total of 2400 a month. So for a house with five rentable rooms, with the total of 2400 a month, minus your utility bills, because of the climate we're in, the figures may vary substantially depending on the deal that you have. Minus your utility, council tax and the landlord's rent, the remainder profit is yours. However, you may find that within one or more of your chosen areas, the numbers just don't work. And that's fine, just move on. For example, you may find a three bedroom house with a dining and living room, two double rooms upstairs for 450 in that area's going rate, a single room at 300, and the double rooms downstairs again at 450. This only leads to you having minimal or no profit. If the landlord wanted 1,400 for this house in this area, it's not going to work. However, do remember that you're always going to try and negotiate the rental amount you pay the landlord within reason. Testing your chosen area. Now that you've provisionally chosen your areas based on distance and potential profit, you still need to make sure that there's enough demand for rooms in this area. Your research may show that rooms can go for great prices. But what good is that if it takes over a month to fill that room? Because there aren't enough people in the area looking. What do you do? Put tester adverts online in your chosen area. For example, you've chosen Clapham. And from your research, rooms can go for $7.50 per month. Put up an ad on Gumtree or spare rooms using generic pictures and stating that the rent is for $7.50 a month. Sit back and monitor how many responses you get. If you receive a lot of inquiries, great. There is a high demand and you could fill that room quickly. If you receive little to no inquiries, this is an alarm bell. Either there's not enough demand or the price you're charging is too high. You can also call landlords and agents who are advertising these rooms and ask them if they've managed to let the rooms at that price. How's it been? If they've had a lot of interest or has the market been quiet? It may also be worth arranging a block viewing on the property before you put any money down just to triple check the demand as people may respond to your ads but not like the property in person. This is where you invite all your interested tenants to come and see the property at the same time so that you only have to go there once. Most agents and landlords are happy to let you do this. Finding the properties, agents and private landlords. There are so many ways to find your properties through both agents and actual landlords themselves. To find them through agents, an easy way is to simply send a bulk email via Rightmove explaining who you are, what you do and the kind of properties you're looking for. Alternatively, you can call the agents and explain over the phone if you feel confident enough and wish to build a closer rapport from the beginning. The idea is to get viewings. You want to aim for at least three viewings per week. To find private landlords, the most common way is to find private property adverts online at places such as Gumtree and Facebook. Send out a message explaining your offer, free management or company let. Selling points and persuasion. 
When speaking to agents or landlords, it's important that you make your proposal sound as beneficial to them as you possibly can. After all, you're not the only person or company giving them offers and you need to stand out. Here are some ideas. For agents, there's no limit to the amount of properties you will take. So they will always have someone they can call who they know will take properties fast, making their job much more easier. For private landlords, you're offering them guaranteed rent over a long-term agreement, meaning that they won't need to think about that property for a long time. They just need to sit back and receive their rent. You're offering to manage the property free of charge, saving them a lot of time, money and stress if you're going down the management route. You will also inspect the house at regular intervals, every three months for example, and hire a cleaner to clean the communal areas every fortnight to ensure the property is kept in good condition. These things are optional. Be sure to get these points across to whoever you're dealing with. Negotiation. Negotiation is key. Make sure you have calculated everything accurately And it's usually a good idea to do worst case calculations. For example, if you've researched and discovered that double rooms in your chosen area are going for an average of £500 a month, calculate that as £460 a month. Once you have your best and worst case scenarios, you'll have an idea of the highest you can possibly offer the landlord. When negotiating the price, Always start lower than what you know you can afford. Worst case, they say no, and you've got room to negotiate up to the amount you already know you can afford anyway. And best case, they agree and your profit has now gone from 500 to 700. Be careful. Don't lose a deal because you're being too greedy. Balance is key. Now remember, Take into consideration the location of the property and the condition. Just because the average rent for a four-bedroom house, for example, is 1500 it doesn't mean that every four-bedroom in that area is worth that amount. One house may be right next door to the train station, newly refurbished, whilst your property may be a little further from the station and in need of a refurbishment. Use your common sense and compare the condition and location of the property to the ones on the market going for the same price. Thank you for listening this far. Here's an industry bonus for you. Most rent-to-rent companies only take on properties that are 0.5 miles away from a train station. This ensures that your home will likely be filled very quickly and consistently have tenants in there. Thank me later. And again, thank you for listening this far. Agreements, property checks. Depending on which strategy you are using, you will need different types of agreements. With agents, you do not need to worry about which agreement to use, as they will usually have their own. With private landlords, using the free management strategy, you simply need a management agreement between you and the landlord, stating what each of your responsibilities are and the agreed rental amount. It is best to get a solicitor to draw this up for you, or you can purchase a pre-drafted one from me. Before signing any agreements, make sure you thoroughly check the property for any faults that your tenants may complain to you about later. For example, a faulty light switch, broken white goods, heating not coming on, etc. Ask if the landlord will fix these faults before you take on the property. If not, factor this into your offer. When viewing the property, think as if you was moving in yourself. What would you be looking out for? Don't be afraid to ask questions and be thorough. Closing the deal. With both strategies, you're going to need some form of professional front. 
Working with private landlords is a little bit more flexible. However, the more professionalism that can be seen, the better your chances. For agents, you're going to need an official company to pass referencing for a company let. This is very easy. There are countless companies online who will officially register your company on your behalf for a small one-off fee and it takes less than 48 hours. However, even once this is done, your company's not going to have any financial credit history for a while which is what referencing companies want to check when you're applying to rent a property. This is where a guarantor comes in. A guarantor needs to be someone who is earning a certain amount per year, usually 36 times the monthly rent, who is willing to sign your tenancy to say that if you don't pay, they will. Explain to the agent that your company is a fairly new company and so there isn't much history to check, but you can provide a guarantor. Most agents are happy with this. For private landlords, you do not necessarily need to have an official registered company, although some may ask for this. You can generally be working as a sole trader and that is sufficient enough. This is because with privates, You are not trying to actually rent the property, you are just managing it. And therefore, no reference checks are needed. A professional website will really help to give the best impression to the landlord and of course, how you present yourself. The landlord needs to have an energy performance certificate, a gas safety certificate and sufficient landlord insurance all in place before you will take on the property. Agents will normally have all of this under control, but be sure to remind your private landlord. Finding your tenant and referencing. So now you've closed a deal, it's time to find your tenants. This is probably the most important part of the whole process, because if you have no tenants, you have no business. Choosing the wrong tenants can be suicide to this business because if they don't pay, you still have to pay the landlord. The advertising part is easy. Using online portals such as Gumtree, Spare Room, Facebook is usually sufficient enough to find your tenants. Now it's time to sell your potential tenants. Make your ads sound as appealing as possible. Highlight all the positive aspects about the house and use the best photos. It is important to state how much money the tenants need to move in so that you don't get time wasters coming to your viewings and then they say they can't afford it. It's also important to always operate with integrity and transparency. If you are taking the property through an agent, you are probably going to be paying at least one month's rent and one month's deposit up front. So you will need to recoup this from your tenants, charging them exactly the same. With privates, you can be more flexible as you're usually not paying anything up front to the landlord. When arranging viewings, it's best to try and do them in blocks. This means having the tenants come as a group. Otherwise, you'll be traveling to and from the property countless times per day. Be careful not to book too many people at the same time though, as this can be intimidating and put people off. Three or four people per viewing is fair. For example, four people at 6pm and the next four people at 6.30pm. Once someone agrees that they'd like to take a room, You want to take a deposit from them as soon as possible whilst they're enthusiastic. Once people leave, they usually disappear. As a general rule, tenants pay one month's deposit. That is to hold the room whilst you carry out their checks. And then one month's rent up front the day they move in. Tenants' deposits. All deposits taken from tenants must be registered with a tenancy deposit scheme. Many of them can be found online. These companies usually offer two types of protection. 
The first is where you pay the deposit to them and they keep it safe until the end of tenancy when all or part of it needs to be returned and will often help with any dispute over how much should be returned. The second option is to insure the deposit where you keep the money and the company insures it so that should you not be able to pay the tenant back at the end of their tenancy, the company will and you will have to pay it back to them. All of this information can be found on Google by searching for tenancy deposit schemes. Be sure to familiarise yourself with the legislation around arrears, eviction and general management of tenants. Before you take a tenant on, you must do a reference check, especially to make sure they are eligible to rent in the UK and they can afford it and all the other laws and stipulates that are required when renting a property out. There are lots of different reference companies that you can find online who will carry out the checks on your behalf for a one-off fee. If the tenant's referencing fails, they will need to provide a home owning guarantor and this guarantor will need to contact the referencing company. If they cannot provide a guarantor, then maybe this is warning bells. Reference checks are for a reason. If they pass, great. You can now sign the tenancy agreement and move them in. It's normally best to start your tenancy with a rental of six months and see how it goes. Cut the keys and move them in. You may also want to do an inventory. This is where you write a checklist with the condition of everything in the property, especially at the time that the tenant moves in. An inventory document is a mutual agreement that both you and the tenant sign stating that the condition of the property is being rented as seen and should any damages occur, they may be charged. This is so important. It not only protects yourself, but the tenant. Getting your property ready. This is the bit that everybody enjoys the most. However, the way you furnish your home will determine the type of tenants you have and how they treat your home. I believe if you give tenants good quality furniture, they will value this. Industry hint, IKEA, I find, is very cost effective. So, some properties you take on, they may already be furnished. Others may not. You will need to provide tenants with the basics, such as a bed, a wardrobe in each room, all white goods in the kitchen, a sofa, dining table, especially if you had shared living space. You will also need to have locks fitted on each bedroom door for their privacy and their security. If the property needs to be cleaned, arrange for this to be done before you start your viewings as you want potential tenants to see the place at its best. I always use diffusers, plugins to give the house a smell, a warm homely smell that encourages the tenants to visualize themselves being in that home. And finally, the legalities. Now that you understand how the process works with the landlord, agents and tenants, it's important to be aware of the legalities before you proceed. Licenses. Properties that are shared are most commonly known as HMOs, meaning houses in multiple occupation. There are rules around renting or managing these kind of properties, which is not adhered to, can carry some heavy penalties and consequences. Every council has their own rules and regulations surrounding HMOs. As a general rule throughout the country, any property that is being let to five or more unrelated people needs something called a HMO license before you can operate. This is where the council may inspect the property to make sure that it is fit for the amount of people who will be sharing. And if satisfied, you will be granted a license 
given you permission to let it as a HMO. If not satisfied, they will tell you what needs to be done to the property and once you've completed the work, they will grant you the licence. Note, the licence sits with the landlord's property, not the rent-to-rent agency. Most people think HMO is something really complicated. It really is a list of mandatory requirements that all properties must have, such as a hard-wired fire alarm system, heat-resistant doors, particular handles, fire extinguishers, fire blankets, etc. Just Google it and all the information is there. It can be time-consuming and expensive with licence fees, usually hitting around the £1,000 mark. For this reason, it's probably best, at least when you're starting out, to avoid five beds altogether, unless the landlord is willing to contribute to the cost. Properties that have less than five tenants almost never need a HMO licence. Some councils do, though, so always check. However, they do still need to adhere to fire safety regulations, things like fire doors and, again, smoke alarm. To make sure you are adhering to the law, always check in with the local council to find out what the specific requirements are for non licensable HMOs and licensable HMOs. As we come to a close, I want to leave you some top tips. Number one, you ideally want to take properties where the profit is at least £600 per month and the profit should always be greater than or equal to your most expensive room. This way, even if you have one room empty, you will always break even. Always check with the council to find out the exact council tax amount for the specific property before doing your calculations as they may differ from house to house. Make sure you register with the property redress scheme and get a list from your local council with all the HMO properties in that area and send letters or flyers to those properties. Get the landlord's attention. When speaking with an agent, find out if the property in question is being marketed by other agents or not. Find out how long the property has been on the market and always make a lower offer than the asking price. Always remember it is important that every property you have has a carbon monoxide detector. It is vital that you have the best internet provider in the area. Your tenants will call you outside of unsociable hours should their internet constantly go down. This is key and this will impact whether your tenants remain or not. Ensure that you give tenants good quality furniture. I cannot stress this enough. The initial upfront cost is not much if you shop around. However, it will impact the duration that your tenants occupy the room. And if you find your funds are low, go for a property that's already furnished. And if you really have low funds, double up with a friend or family. But don't forget that working agreement because money sometimes can make things go wrong. And make sure you're operating within the law. Check out what your local authority laws are, your local government laws, so you are always operating within the law. This is a guide only. It is your responsibility to find out the finer details. Then just share in the comments section how I can improve this. But for now, take care of yourself and good luck on your property journey.